We'll be reading out of Psalms 116, 1 through 7. Psalms 116, 1 through 7. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The pains of death surround me, and the pains of Sheol lay hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully for you with me. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so thankful that we can come and praise you. You are a God who is worthy of all praise, of all men, of all the years. Simultaneous praise is due you upon your creation each and every individual. Lord, I praise you that you have called us out of this world into your life and into your church and brought us here to praise your name with one another for that is what you, you ask us to do. Do you need praises from us, Father? No. But we get to enjoy you. We get to enjoy your grace. We get to enjoy your mercy. And how can we not be thankful? And how can we not say praise you, O oh God? I thank you that this day is given to you. And that everything else can just stay and remain where it's at. But we come here for that one purpose, to worship you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. What will be singing from the screens? Uh, first song is uh, Morning Has Broken. <laughs> Thank you. 
going to begin reading in verse 11, reading through verse 13. Follow along with me as I read. The scripture says, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray. Father, we're, we're indeed grateful this morning that you are Lord over all and that you are rich towards all that call upon your name. Father, thank you for the mercy that you have shown us. And as we read and study together this morning, I pray that you would help us to dive into the depths of what you mean. If we're saved, we know what it means, but there's, there's always more to see of your beauty and your grace and your glory and your majesty. We pray that you bring that out. We pray that we would have receptive hearts to hear it, that would be better equipped servants to go out from this place and serve you with joy and looking forward and hastening the day of your second. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing the thought that we've been looking at for the last two weeks. And that is the plan of God to save people from their sins has always been by grace through faith. So this is the third message on this topic. Paul has continued to prove throughout this whole passage that the Old Testament verifies the facts that he's laying forth. In almost every verse, at least every other verse, he's quoting the Old Testament. The Jews, of course, would have been very acquainted with the Old Testament and would have trusted it. And that's going to be the pattern again for today's message. The first quote, verse 11, comes straight out of Isaiah 28, 16. And the second quote is verse 13, and that is straight out of Joel 2.32. I will admit, I, I, I love this passage. And, and if you've been around the church any length of time, you, you're probably very familiar with this passage as well. But I will admit, as a 21st century Gentile believer living in the United States of America, I've always looked at this section as being a, a wonderful, general, indiscriminate call for anyone to come to the Lord and to be saved. And it is all that. And more. And the and more this morning is kind of the side that I'm going to delve into a little bit more. And this is really the beauty of expository preaching because as we have learned and we, we kind of bang this drum often, every scripture has a context. It has a reason why it appears where it appears and for what reason it appears there. There's a reason why Paul is saying this particular passage here and now, even though we see it as, as a wonderful general call for anyone and everyone to accept Christ. We, we, we believe that. We know that. But why is it here at this place? So kind of remember what our context is. Look back again at verse 1 of chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He has a burden. He has a burden for his Israelite brothers and sisters who have not received Christ. Who have not believed in Christ. And remember the big context question that we've repeated several times throughout chapter 9 and chapter 10. There would have been a lingering question after chapters 1 through 8, Paul going through chapters 1 through 8 and, and outlining the gospel in, in great detail, there would have been a lingering question. And that question again, we've said many times before, is if Jesus is the Messiah, then why didn't the Jews receive him? 
when he came. And the second word that would have gone along with that is, is this gospel that you're teaching us now, Paul, is this something new? Is this something new? Paul's point through the whole last chapter and this one up to this point is that especially to you Jewish folks that I'm writing to, remember the, the Roman church was comprised of Jews and Gentiles, but he's more addressing Jews at this point. He is saying, listen, and this is the reason why he's doing the pattern that he's doing. It was there all along. It was there all along. You moved. You moved off into traditions. You moved off into your prideful uh, self-righteousness. <coughs> God never moves. He never changes. The Amen. truth of the scriptures was there all along. Amen. And that's what he's doing in this section is every other verse at least he's going back and reminding them. It was there. It was there. It was there. These verses come right out of the Old Testament. It was clear in Scripture all along that Jesus is the Messiah, and this is nothing new. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. I want to make one point on verse 11 before I go on. Because as, as I was studying this, it's, again, the, the verse says, For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And uh, I remember years ago when I, when I first started studying the scripture and listening to Christian music, there was a song. And it was like an old Jewish song. And, and, it, and it was that verse from Isaiah. And it goes like this. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone. I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, he that believeth shall, shall not make haste. Have any of you ever heard that video before? Okay. All right. I'm sure I didn't do it justice either. But it was a it was a Jewish, very Jewish flavor to the way that, that verse went. So I just I just quoted the verse for you out of Isaiah. And you may be looking at your passage here in Romans going, well, that's, that's not exactly what he said. It was the end part of that verse. He that believeth shall not make haste. And here it says, he that believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So I just wanted to take a second and explain why both of those are saying exactly the same thing. And the meaning that came out to me this week as I studied that, just it was, just, it was everywhere I looked in the scripture. So, God has said he's the foundation, he's the sure foundation, he's the, he's the cornerstone, he's the rock that everything is built upon. This word in, in our text of, if you believe you'll not be ashamed, that's a good word, but maybe a better word would be disappointed. It has to do with the idea that if you come to Jesus Christ in faith, in genuine faith, and you're saved, you're a believer, you'll never be disappointed in what you've found. You'll never look back and have regrets and go, yeah, I just wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I wouldn't have made that commitment. I have never heard a true believer in Jesus Christ say, you know what, I really regret making that decision. It just never happens. It never happens. So the, the, the way it kind of goes together is that if you are... You remember uh, Jesus' teaching from Matthew 7, the house built upon a rock? What happens to that house? It never moves. So you see the connection now? So in other words, I will not make haste. In other words, I will not be running away. I will not be looking for something else. I will not be searching for another avenue, another path, because I've found it, and I'm not moving. So we talked about this uh, last week, about how... If you have real genuine faith, I, I use the example of Polycarp, of how he stayed at the stake and was burned alive without ever being fastened to it. Why? Because he has that kind of faith. And all believers have that kind of faith. 
And you may think at this point, sitting here in, you know, luxury 21st century America, that, you know, I don't know if I would have, you would. If you were brought to that point, and you have genuine faith, if your life was put on the line for your faith, you, God would give you the grace in that moment to do whatever you need to do. You can trust that. You would not be moved if you had genuine, genuine faith. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit cannot deny himself. And if the Holy Spirit is in you, he can't deny himself. He will keep his faith. Anyway, I wanted to touch on that before we go on. It's a beautiful verse. But this, this, we come to this verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now when we come, again, in our, in our modern church, when we come to that verse, we say, of course those are, there's no difference. We know that. We know that God is no respecter of persons. We know that his desire is for all men everywhere to repent and come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 2.4, 2 Peter 3.9. And we know that God so loved the world that he gave us a son. We know that. We know there's no difference that he'll save anybody, anywhere, any race, any creed. No, not creed. Any race, any culture, any upbringing, poor, rich. doesn't matter. Amen? He will save anybody that calls upon him. But for the Jew, the thought that God would look at a Gentile the same way he did a Jew is unthinkable. It's shocking. This statement that we look at right here in verse 12 and go, yeah, of course. The Jew would look at it and go, you're absolutely kidding me. No way. The Jews are on the first class plane. And everybody else is, if they make it, just going to get there because... Eh, God really was lowering his standards that day. But the Jews, they're going on the first class bus. That was their thinking. How did they get there? Well, we've talked about that. Um, it shouldn't have been that way. We've talked about some of the reasons that devolved to make that come to that place. But from the very beginning, God designed it so that Israel would be the vehicle for the whole world to come to know God. Started all the way back in Genesis 12, 3, when he told Abraham that through you, Abraham, all the world's going to be blessed. Your line is going to bring the Messiah. In Exodus 19, 6, he told them they were a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What does a priest do? A priest communicates the needs of the people to God. He brings people to God. And they also knew that, you know, there were people in their midst like Rahab the Canaanite and Ruth the Moabite and Uriah the Hittite that were accepted in as the people of God, but they kind of looked at them as, eh, they're kind of the exception and not the rule. We we're letting them in because they came in and, and they started doing Judaism real well. So we kind of said, okay, they can. But there was no big evangelistic effort to go out and bring the masses of the Gentiles in. It was, it was kind of only the ones that were really banging the door down. That they said, okay, okay, you can come. And over the time, over the years, the Jews had actually eventually come to a place where they despised the Gentiles. They had customs like Whenever they traveled to a foreign land and they were going to come back into Israel, they would symbolically stop at the border, shake out all their clothes, and, and dust the dust off their feet before they came back into Israel. To symbolically say that I'm getting all the Gentile ugliness off of me before I go back into my homeland. They would never shake hands or touch a Gentile. It would never into a, into a, a Gentile's home. One famous quote from a, a Jewish rabbi actually was made into a prayer where Jewish men actually said this prayer every day. And in the prayer it says, um, 
I thank my God that I'm not a woman slave or a Gentile. That was part of their daily prayer. But this is not how God intended for them relate to relate to the Gentiles. Now, I have a whole list of scriptures here. I'm only going to read just a, a sampling so you get the flavor. This is what God actually said to the Jewish nation. Leviticus 19.9. When you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not fully reap the corners of the field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest, and thou shalt not glean the vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grain of the vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 27, 19. Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And all the people shall say, Amen. 2 Chronicles 6, 32. Moreover, concerning the stranger, which is not of thy people Israel, but is come from a far country for thy great name's sake, and thy mighty hand, and thy stretched out arm. If they come and pray in this house, then hear thou from the heavens, even from thy dwelling place, and do according to that that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all the people of the earth may know thy name and fear thee, as doth thy people Israel, and may know that this house, which is, which I have built, is called by thy name. God repeatedly throughout the Old Testament said you're supposed to reach out, be kind, and be helpful to strangers, Gentiles. And you're supposed to show the light of the world to them so they will want to come and know me. There's a book in the Old Testament. Um, we love this book because it's got exciting stories. The book of Jonah. It's got big whales. It's got uh, growing gourds. And all, all really neat stuff. You know, I was thinking that the the Jewish year is kind of it's kind of a liturgy. Around certain events, they have certain passages that they read all throughout the year. I, I was just thinking off offhand of you know the different books they read at the different events, and they're pretty much a smattering of all the books, a lot of the songs. But one book that I never hear them quote at any of their festivals, or any of their readings, or any of their special times. Job. Why do you think that is? Well, let's think about the book of Jonah for a minute. God comes to Jonah, Jonah's a prophet, and God says, Jonah, I want you to go over there to the city of Nineveh, and I want you to preach to them. I want you to preach to them and let them know that not happy with their ways, and judgment's going to come unless they repent. Now, what was Nineveh? Nineveh was a, a tremendous city in, in the ancient world. In the 8th century BC, it was the kingdom of the Assyrians. Now, we know this in biblical history, and we also know this in extra biblical history. The Assyrians were one of the most hated, notorious, evil people that ever have lived on the earth. They, they did um, terrorist raids. They, they just did um, despicable acts to, to other humans. And the northern kingdom especially, they used to just come through great pillage and plunder and, and go back and, and over and over and over again. The, the, the northern kingdom of Israel was just terrorized on a, on a routine basis by the kingdom of Assyria. And for a long time, folks even thought that Jonah was a myth because they, they, they said, well, no place like that, no place called Nineveh ever existed. Well, it wasn't discovered until sometime in the uh, 1800s. Archaeologists finally found the city of Nineveh. And, and the reason for that is because God also decided to judge Nineveh later on. He, he, he said he was going to destroy Nineveh and he did it, and he did it so completely uh, using the Babylonians that there was no trace of Nineveh for, for centuries 
I mean, they just, they, they, they killed everybody, they burned it, raised it to the ground, and then they just covered it up with dirt, and they said, okay, it never existed. And, and for years, it was a, a byword, and people just didn't go there. They, they hated the Assyrians so much, they just never went there. So, but they did. They finally found Nineveh. And they found out that it was a huge, huge city. The Bible says that it, took, it would take three days just to walk across it. Three days journey just to walk across one side to the other. So you can imagine. You can imagine. God tells Jonah, all right, Jonah, you know those Assyrians over there that live in Nineveh? I want you to go give them the gospel message and tell them I want to be their God. I want them to repent and they come to be my people. Well, we know the story, right? Jonah's like, I don't think that's a good idea at all. Not only am I not going to do, it, do that, I'm going to get, a, get on a ship and I'm going to go in the exact opposite direction. I'm going to go as far away from Nineveh as I can possibly go. And we all know the story. God prepares a, a fish and after the sailors throw him off and he gets swallowed by the, the fish and uh, God gets his attention and he finally goes and does what he's supposed to do. By the way, um, it's a fish. Not a way. The word whale is nowhere in Jonah. You can read it, read it, read it. There's no whales in Jonah. There's only a fish. It must have been a big fish. It was a prepared fish. That's what the Bible says. A prepared fish. So anyway, after the fish spits him out on dry ground, he runs over and does what he's supposed to do. As the prophet of God, he's being obedient. He goes in and he preaches to the Assyrians. In Nineveh. And can you imagine? I, I had some funny times thinking, Josh and I had a great conversation yesterday thinking about this. Can you imagine what the attitude of this preacher was when he showed up in Nineveh? And I can imagine it was either one of two things. One of two things. It was the most angry, pew heating sermon that you could ever imagine. You lousy Assyrians, you're sinners before God. He hates your sin and he's going to fry you. I mean, there would have been a fire and been brimstone message like you have never heard before. It was either that or it was the most apathetic sermon that you could ever imagine. All right, guys, I've been told to be here. I don't want to be here. I don't like you people. But God told me to tell you that he's going to judge you unless you change your way. So I, it, it's one of those two. And, and what a great testimony for the primacy of Scripture. Because you know he didn't go there with love in his heart to reach out to the people of Nineveh to bring them to his God. It was, it was, it was one of those, I'm sure. And we know that for sure because after he preaches this sermon, whatever it was, the whole city got saved. They repented. They, they turned to the Lord, crying for mercy. Now, it only lasted for a generation or so. They went back to their ways, but the whole city got saved. It was an amazing revival. And you can imagine him preaching this apathetic sermon. All right, here I am. And all of a sudden, people are weeping in the aisles. They're, they're just sobbing for God to not judge them. Can you believe this? So, what does he do? He does his thing. He punches. He checks the box. Okay, God, I did my thing. And then he goes out in the desert. And what he's actually hoping to see is a firestorm. He's hoping to see that God's going to destroy him anyway. And then he does. And then he's mad. He's really mad. He's upset. And God comes and says, you know, what's going on, Jonah? Why are you downcast? Why are you so angry? And this is Jonah's answer. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. This is Jonah 4, 1 and 2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. 
He knew God's character for being compassionate and merciful and a saving God. And he knew if he went over there with the power of God's word that he was going to change their hearts and they were going to repent and believe. And he didn't want them as fellow believers in the kingdom. That was the attitude of the Jews or the Gentiles. This attitude stems from an attitude of pride, elitism, and a works-based righteousness. But they're not all that way. There were some good Jews that believed in the Lord. Thought about Mary. Thought about Mary. When the angel came and told Mary, you're going to conceive and bear a child. He's going to be the Messiah. He's going to save the people from their sins. What was Mary's reaction? It could have been a victory lap around the, the, the village saying, he picked me, he picked me, not you or you or you, he picked me. This was the desire of every Jewish woman from the dawn of time. This, this started with Eve. Every woman that was a Jew ever lived on the planet hoped that they would bring the Messiah. It was not a reaction at all, was it? It was humility and grace. So there were those Jews too. But for the most part, it was the other. Even if they did do it, they did it reluctantly. But most hated the Gentiles. When Jesus came on the scene, he came first to the Jews. But he made it clear that the message of salvation was for all men. Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Acts 1, 8, talking to his apostles, he said, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses un unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus wanted all people to hear the good news of the gospel and come to be saved. Today, the nation of Israel contain, continues the same pattern. Those that are involved in Judaism spend little to no effort in evangelizing Gentiles. They are not going out of their way to tell people that are not Jews about their God. But at some point in the future, they will. During the tribulation, their hearts will change, they will repent, and they will come back and be the vehicle that God uses to win the nations. And then that's where we're going. We're going in chapter 11. We're going to be talking a lot more about that. While the church, on the other hand, has successfully taken the gospel to the whole known world. There's not a continent in existence today that doesn't have the gospel flourishing in some parts of it. Paul was particularly called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. That was his specific mission that Jesus called him to do. But even though he was, when he entered into a city, he didn't go straight to the Gentiles. Where did he always go? He went to the synagogue, right? Or wherever the Jews would meet in a specific place. And I, I always thought that it was for the, the fact of to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It was Jewish supremacy that was the reason why he was doing that. MacArthur has another idea, and I, I, he swayed me to this point. I, I believe that he's on to something here. MacArthur points out that the reason why he went to the synagogue first is the same reason why he's doing this here in Romans. If he would have gone to the Gentiles first in any new city preaching the gospel, the Jews would not have had anything to do with it. They wouldn't have wanted to hear a thing he had to say. And as his pattern went, he always went to the synagogue first, and it always says a few believed. Most didn't, but a few believed. And then he would take his message to the Gentiles. 
But at least he went and delivered the message to them first. And some of them believed. So his heart is always, like he started this passage here, he starts with saying, even though he's called to be the apostle to the Gentiles, that's his mission, his heart is still for his brethren in the flesh. He wants the Jews to be saved. That's why he points this out here. They need to know. Just because there was a chosen people, they were the vehicle that God used to bring the scriptures and the revelation of God. He didn't love them more than he loved other people to be saved. Paul points this out in the New Testament in Galatians 3.28. He says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Anybody who is a child of God by faith is a child of Abraham because that's how he came to be God's child by faith. So in the faith family, it's all the same. There's no pecking order. There's no first class, second class. There's no rank. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 2.11, he says this, Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which was called <coughs> circumcision, in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens to the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. And in the next chapter, a few verses later, he says this, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The Gentiles are the same footing in Christ that the Jews are. One other note I want to make before I make a couple applications. Verse 13, there's this phrase. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see that there? One of the passages we read this morning, Psalm 116, had that phrase in there. That's the reason I chose it. Call upon the name of the Lord. It first appears in Scripture in Genesis 4. It says, and Adam knew his wife again and bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, she said, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And unto Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. In Psalm 105, uh, 1 through 5, it says this, O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing praises unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. Calling upon the name of the Lord is, it's all-encompassing. It's really what it means to be a Christian. It's trusting God believing God, it's obeying God, it's communing with God, it's having a relationship with God. That's what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. Your life is ordered in such a way that it is in direct relationship with God. You're trusting Him, you're walking with Him, you're praying to Him, you're relying on Him, you're depending on Him. And here's the point I want to make. Jesus has already clearly identified the Lord in this passage, look back at verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Everybody see that? So here's the point I want to make. All those passages I just read, and I can go back and read you 50 more from the Old Testament. That word Lord in the Old Testament is capital L in most of your Bibles, capital L, and then capital O-R-D in a smaller font. And anytime you see that in your Old Testament, that word is translated 
Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, or Jehovah, the covenant name of God. In Isaiah 43, 11, Scripture says this, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. Again, that's Yahweh, or Jehovah, saying, I am the only Savior. Paul says that Jesus is the Lord. So what that means is those Jews in the Old Testament that were praying for salvation and calling upon the name of the Lord and had a relationship with the living God were actually all along praying to and calling upon Jesus. He has always been the Savior. It's nothing new. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus has always been the Savior. Jesus is the part of the Godhead designed to be the Savior of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When the angel Gabriel came and told his stepfather on earth, Joseph, what to name him, what did he say? Thou shalt call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The word Jesus in English is Yahshua in Hebrew. And the word Yeshua means the Lord is Savior, or the Savior is the Lord. <clears throat> so even his name identifies exactly who he is. So two points today, two quick points. Number one. We're not like the Jews, are we? We don't we don't hate other people groups. We don't hate people that are not like us. Different colors, different cultures. We would never reserve the gospel from anybody that doesn't look like us and act like us and think like us, right? I was reading an article yesterday. Chrissy sent me an article. It's by David Jeremiah and. I had to think about this. It was I was at the tail end of this movement, coming growing up. But back in the '60s, there was a movement. Um, they were called hippies or or beatniks. They had different terms for them, but it was the uh, it was a real rebellious time in America. It was protesting the Vietnam War, and, and young people during that time. Some were on college campuses. Some had nothing to do with colleges. But it had to do with music and drugs and long hair, just a general state of rebellion. And in, in the culture of that day, it became a, a, a very sharp schism as to, you know, people in, in culture treated them as, you know, outcasts and lawbreakers, didn't want to have anything to do with them. Well, something very unique happened during the 60s. These young people, they were just looking to find their way and looking to, I mean, they. They, they didn't agree with some of the things that were going on in politics, decided that they wanted to rebel against the Vietnam War and things like that. Well, all of a sudden, these people all over the place started getting saved. These hippies became children of God. And there was a real struggle at the time that you would have, you would have a church like this, you know, in any other church, and then all of a sudden you would have a, 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 a bunch of people show up on a Sunday that didn't look like you, and didn't act like you, didn't talk like you. Some of them hadn't bathed for weeks, wore tore tattered clothes, had very, very long hair, had different language. And there were some, some received them, and, and put their arm around them and said, welcome to the kingdom. And others did not. Others pushed them away. And said, you need to clean up before you come in here. Amen? So I'm just throwing this out there. We as Christians never exclude people because of X, Y, Z. Today that same group has green hair and purple hair and nose rings. 
You know, it's the same young people that are just looking to find their way. They're looking for God, really. Amen? Amen. And you and I need to help them find it. You and I need to be the ones that goes around and puts our arm around their shoulders and says, hey, look. I just want to be your friend. I want to tell you about my friend. My Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what popped into my head while I was thinking about all this was, what if God came to Kid Man and said, Kid Man, why don't you go up there to that Washington place and find that lady Pelosi and go give her the gospel? Would I be getting on a ship for Tarshish today? <laughs> maybe. But maybe not. And here's, here's what I thought about. Because here's the one thing I know. If I did have an audience, first of all, she would have to lay down the golden scepter for me to give me walk, walk in there. And I would probably never have an audience with somebody like that. But if I did, if I did, I, I would certainly strike up a conversation, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping the Spirit to bring it around to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if the Lord so led and opened up the door and I was able to share the gospel and she got saved, here's the one thing I know. Her heart would be changed. Would be different from that day forward. So I would like to think that I would. I would like to think that I would. But we need to kind of think about that. Let's let God do the cleaning up. Amen? It's His Word that does the work. We can't pick and choose who we want to be in the kingdom. The other one is back to the original point. God calls everyone, anyone, regardless of status, color, nationality, education, to himself for salvation. And the only barrier to salvation is pride and unbelief. Revelation 5, 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That's a picture of heaven right there. God's going to bring them all. Like the old song said, red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loved the little children of the world. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that you are indiscriminate and ready to be a God for anybody that humbles themselves and calls upon your name in faith believing. Thank you that you have made it easy. Thank you that you have done all the work ahead of time in Jesus. He did all the heavy lifting. What we could never do, paying the price of our sin on the cross. Thank you for the law that you give us to walk by and abide by, to be blessed in, to know your ways and to know your character, to know what pleases you. And then, Lord, thank you for the privilege of being servants to show other people one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. Lord, let that always be our humble approach to ministry. Help us, Lord, as a church and as individuals to be ready anytime, any place that you make the opportunity available to share the gospel with those that need it. Father, if there's anybody here today that needs the gospel, we pray that you'll open their hearts to believe in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have an invitation. If you need to respond to God's word in any way today, we invite you to come and we stand together and sing. 605, 605.